The presenting sponsor for On Education is Classcraft. You won't believe what Classcraft has in store for you at ISTE 2019. Stop by the Classcraft booth and complete the new AR experience to be entered in a drawing for a Nintendo Switch. Do you want twice the chance to win? Simply put us, On Education, as your referring friend on the form. To learn more about Classcraft, visit classcraft.com slash oneducation. I haven't done anything crazy, but the children sometimes take things. They'll <laughs> take them. And you let them. All right, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. We are joined by Tom Hobson. Thanks for joining us, man. Hi, it's good to see you. Good, both of you guys. Awesome. Thank you. I guarantee you that there's people that listen to our podcast specifically that won't know who you are, even though there is a whole universe. We're going to talk about this in a minute. There's a whole universe of people who know who you are, and that's why you're here. But I, can, I know for sure that there's a lot of people that are in our wheelhouse that wouldn't know who you are. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself to everyone that's listening. Okay, well, I mean, the, the name Tom Hobson probably means nothing to most people. Um, I, I'm mainly known as Teacher Tom. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a, well, fundamentally, I'm a preschool teacher. I've been teaching at the Woodland Park Cooperative School in Seattle, Washington for the last 18 years. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I'm best known on the internet for my namesake blog, uh, Teacher Tom. Uh, and it's, I've been writing there every day since 2009. Wow. Uh, so trying to get at least, there's some years in there where I had 365 posts. Wow. Um, but mostly what I, well, it, it's, it's not even just dedication. It really is the centerpiece of my practice in many ways. Yeah. Uh, for me, the blogging is, a, it's, it's a key part of my reflective practice as a teacher. And I think that's one of the things about, uh, especially teaching in early years, that's really important is, is to be reflective on what you're doing because you, you if, if you're not if you're not taking the time to try and understand what you're saying you're, you're only doing half your job uh, because being researchers and educators is is our, our go hand in hand we have to be learning at the same time the children are or else it gets calcifying and we you know we quit being good teachers yeah absolutely so you're here at USM Spark, uh, just like the rest of us. What are you? What are you doing here? What What have you been up to? Well, I've been honored. This is the first year that's been a, a section of this conference set aside for preschool for early years teachers. So there's some forty of us here uh, at the conference this year, and um, I'm talking specifically about um, really the why why we educate children in the first place. I'm trying to take a step back because that's what conferences mm. are for, right? I mean, yes. we have those day to day. We're in there in the room, especially those of us in the early years. We're there. We we chose to be there for, you know, those little reasons to spend the moments with those children because we love those little hands in our hands because we love the, the 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 gentleness of their tears soaking through our shirts when we're comforting them, uh, you know, taking care of them and all that. But some these conferences are great because it gives us a chance to step back and ask big questions and really uh, figuring out, you know. Why are we bothering educating children in the first place? Yeah. Um, and basically, I think it comes down to what John Dewey said, the great John Dewey, you know, the, fa- the grandfather of progressive education. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, democracy must be born anew with each generation, and education is its midwife. Mm. And so I think fundamentally what we're doing is, is we're educating not people for the workforce. We're not educating people for any other reason than to uh, so that they can be good citizens. Yes, so they will be fantastic. the kind of people who can engage in this process of self-governance. And I think, you know, we can argue all day long about whether the U.S. or Canada is succeeding at democracy, mm-hmm. but we do hold it as values. And it's mm-hmm. something that uh, I do think uh, when education's lost its way in a lot of regards, because we focus so much on vocational training and not enough on just self-governance, the skills and, and talents required for that. Which is, which is what you do when you have play-based education, yeah. uh, project-based, play-based, child-led learning. That really is the, 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 the Germans say Grundstufe, the foundation for uh, democracy. Tom's bringing the German. <laughs> yes. I, I was just thinking, because Mike had mentioned this earlier off-air, just that you may not be well-known, except maybe really, really well-known within these circles, these pre-K through two circles. And even at conferences, we've talked about, Mike and I, that that specific group gets ignored uh, as far as the sessions that are available for them to be able to attend. But I think even further than that, we ignore especially preschool education as uh, as a legislative group within our states. For example, in Minnesota, whether or not we decide to even fund it, 
at the same level that we're funding everything else. And it becomes this kind of extra thing that we're, that we kind of tack on. Well, I guess we need some preschool education where we all know it's fundamental to the growth of these kids. And, and the research shows that, but yet we can't bring on our legislators and, and, and make, make it sure of that. What do you think about all of that? In, well, in I, I mean, I think some of what you said is absolutely spot on. Um, I have some concerns sometimes because I've watched what uh, policymakers do when they get involved in education. Mm. And sometimes they go down the completely wrong path. I yes. believe, especially in the U.S., our schools have become increasingly academic focused mm. and less focused on those fundamental skills of democracy and, and citizenship, uh, cooperation, working together, community building, yeah. um, those kind of things. And we've spent so much time, we've somehow decided that uh, we're going to be a testocracy. We're going to, mm. we're going to, we, we think that, you know, the more we weigh the hog, the fatter it's going to get. And that, that obviously is not going to happen. Uh, and so I feel like what we, what I, so it worries me when I hear, when I talk about policymakers getting involved oh, in early years, sometimes, sure. because I've seen it go the wrong way too often, because what happens is legis, uh, legislative bodies and that everyone knows this is true. If you, they have a choice to listen to somebody who's funding their campaign mm. or the voice of a three-year-old, they're always going to choose the one with the pocketbook. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that's what happens so often is it's really we don't have, um, we don't have kind of the, 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 that clout. What we have is um, we have the opportunity to build an army of, of, of children and their parents who can advocate. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I hope we do. That's what I hope we're trying to do. Um, what happens though, is we do get lost in conferences like this one. Not, this one, I don't think so, but in a lot of places lot we of get, places. so we become secondary. And part of that is, um, I mean, I go back and forth on this. I agree with you completely. The research is there. Early childhood education is important. At the same time, the fact that it's important is a, is a sign that our basic culture has changed significantly in the last hundred years. Mm. Um, it used to be, we used to have an economy set up so that one parent could stay home and raise kids. Yes. You know, it was usually the woman, but you know, that, that could change. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to, it's not gender based, it does, but the children then they didn't, they had their neighborhoods, you know? And I always think to myself that, you know, what most of us early years was all about was when I was as young as four years old, mom would say, you're driving me crazy. Go outside. <laughs> yes. You know, and she'd close the door Absolutely. behind me and a four year old, and she'd just send me out on the street. If you do that today, Child Protective Services yeah, is there to arrest you. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but we would go outside, and what's the first thing you do? You walk outside, you say, where are the other kids? Yeah, and then and, and if you didn't see some other kids, you started knocking on the doors. That's a skill <laughs> no kid has anymore. No. You walk up and down the street, and you knock on the door, and can Johnny come out and play? Can Lisa come out and play? Can Frankie? Yes. You didn't care if they were boys. You didn't care if they were girls. You didn't care if they are older. You didn't care if they were younger. You were just looking for other kids to play with. And then yeah, you yeah. Got, once you got those kids, you are outside with kids unsupervised <laughs> and you had an unlimited amount of time to play yes. and to explore and to, and to learn the fundamental skills that you need to learn. And so the foundational skills, we don't have that opportunity right now. I don't think the world has changed, but I think our perception of the world has changed. And I don't know that that's going to change anytime soon. So for me, what the early years settings need to do is try to the degree we can to recreate that experience that children always had for hundreds of years. Certainly going back, well, I shouldn't say hundreds of years, really, you know, kind of post-World War II, kind of that, that 1950s, 1960s, 1970s kind of childhood when we didn't take school too seriously, when uh, we, had, we had the opportunities for children to grow up, you know, raise themselves in a way yeah. in the early years amongst other kids outdoors with lots of time and unsupervised. Mm. <laughs> I, um, I was, I, I've been... Anyone who will listen to me the last couple of days, I've been telling them about you and talking about the things you've done and how my wife, Cheryl, has been reading your blog for seven or eight years. And, um, and, and I've, you know, she'll show me the stuff that you write about and she'll just be like, can you freaking believe that this is happening? Um, I want to talk about, like, and you just hinted at it, about the idea of unstructured play, about, you know, letting kids explore and learn on their own. Um, You've done, I, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I'm, I'm sure that you're going to come up with something. You've done some pretty wild things out there, and you write about them all the time. What's, what's the coolest, kind of craziest, maybe, thing that you think you've done in, in the last little while? Well, you know, it's, I, I, okay, well, I'll, I'll correct you slightly. You might I, not think it's crazy I at all. I haven't done anything crazy, but the children sometimes take things 
They'll and take you, the, and you let them. The, the provocation. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I trust children. Yeah. Fundamentally, what we need to do is trust. One of my favorite ones was, um, so there was this whole project, and I was actually doing sort of a little game with a blogger in Australia. And so one of us had posted a blog post about how you put marbles with some paper and a pie pan, and you roll the, it would put paint in there, and you roll the marbles around and create sort of a painting. And then she got these bigger boxes to do it, and then I got these giant boxes to do it. <laughs> and at some points, we ended up where I put a hole, you know, like a big gray tarp out on the, on the ground, and we dumped paint in the middle of it, and I got a soccer ball out, and the kids were supposed to be kicking the soccer ball back. That was the idea, is to type a giant marble painting. I can see how this and, goes off the rails. Well, exactly. So within, within you know, 10 minutes, the kids are just writhing around and just having this big old, you know, this, their whole bodies were covered in paint. They were slipping around. Trying, they, it was like a slip and slide in paint. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it was, um, it was pretty, mirac- you know, then we got out the hose and we hosed the kids off and we hosed the tarp off and that was fun too. Yes. Um, that's it. I think one of the ones that I, the stories I like the most is, you know, we use hot glue guns, mm-hmm. which a lot of preschools don't do. And we, even the two-year-olds get to use the hot glue guns. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, and, and, so, and they can use it. They're competent to do this. Yes. I mean, people say, well, don't the two-year-olds burn themselves? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Everybody burns themselves when they use hot glue guns. Yes. I do it every time I use one. Uh-huh. And that's part of the process of learning how to use a hot glue gun. So anyway, um, I, I thought this was a good idea because I was sick of watching them with the white glue and everything, everything falls down and doesn't cure fast enough. And so they can't really create with their minds. And mm-hmm. hot glue guns, you can make these elaborate sculptures that out of anything. You yes. just take stuff out of the recycling box and build it. And so I thought, you know, I want to have that power in their hands. And so I turned it over to kids, and they started playing with this, and, and then I blogged about it. And, uh, and then people all over the world picked up on that, and then other people were using hot glue guns in their preschools. And so it's, now it's become pretty common. Very cool. Um, what I love about this is my insurance company has this little line in the policy <laughs> that says, you know, we'll cover injuries for any, you know, normal preschool activities. Yes, well, I can prove it's a normal preschool activity. People all over the world are doing it. <laughs> That's amazing. What a story. That's um, awesome. Tom, tell us kind of what's going on in your life. What are you up to? What are you, uh, where can people connect with you and stuff like that? Well, I mean, the, the basic place is Teacher Tom's blog. So if yeah. you just Google Teacher Tom, you'll find it. Uh, it's a blog spot blog, so it has a, a long addendum. So it's Teacher Tom. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook. I have a Teacher Tom Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and I've got a book uh, called nice. Teacher Tom's First Book. And again, you can, uh, we are, you know, we have made the conscious decision to avoid Amazon. So we're selling oh, wow. it ourselves. We're it's a pure entrepreneurial enterprise. There yeah. There's no middleman taking out the money. It's uh, my publisher and I going 50 50, and we're, uh, we're just, we're doing it on our own. Nice. And so you just find Teacher Tom's First Book, and you can find that website. And it's, uh, so anyway, those, that's what I'm up to right now. And I'm yeah. also, I'll be leaving. So I'm here at this conference here. I fly out tomorrow f- to go to Sydney, Australia. Then I'll wow. be down in Australia for two and a half weeks or so um, doing per- uh, professional development down there. Oh, you are. Speaking at conferences and that kind of stuff. And then, uh, then I'm back in Seattle again to run my summer camp. Wow. Amazing. What a journey. Awesome. Teacher Tom, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are here with Diane Cashin, who is at USM Spark as well. Um, Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you give us uh, a little bit of who you are, where you're from, Mm -hmm. and and all that before we get started? Well, I'm from Canada, specifically Ontario and Toronto, yay, Raptors. You're saying we might be the only Canadians here. (laughs) Yes, uh, well, we're representing. Yes. Um, And I am an registered early childhood educator because in Ontario we do re- um, there's a regulatory body that license us to practice but I haven't been teaching directly with children for about 30 years okay I um, my background is teaching ECEs at the college and university level diploma and degree and I do a lot of workshops traveling and now to consult because I retired from teaching mm, fantastic uh, and so we are all at uh, uh, USM Spark. So what are you doing here specifically? Right. So I understand this is the first year that um, they wanted to do something for the preschool early years. Yes. 
and I got an email and uh, would I come and of course uh, why not yeah um, I love to travel and uh, love to spread spread the word about the importance of the early years because it is an overlooked area and so I was so pleased that they were focusing on that and that I was invited along with teacher Tom what an honor yeah dramatically overlooked dramatically yeah, yeah sadly like, we've been talking a little bit about it about yeah. how there's like there would be so let's actually get into this you're one of your specialties is reggio type yes. of education and i guarantee you that there will be listeners here so my wife is a kindergarten teacher and yes. she uh, our connection is that she was actually in one of your courses in in the toronto area and spent three days with you learning from you yes and she's a giant fan of yours and oh, said so said crazy. she's going to be there you need to interview <laughs> her and, and so this is this is how we we've connected which is awesome she's gonna be smiling right now when she's listening to this so that's great um so cheryl said you got it you got to talk to her but she said no i guarantee you hardly anyone that listens to your podcast probably knows what reggio is so maybe give us like the reggio 101 as yes. as like <laughs> as like bare bones as you can as but so we get a gist of it can. yeah so reggio emilia is from the reggio emilia approach is from reggio emilia italy north central italy uh if you imagine the boot that is italy it's up near the top right in the middle uh it's was is a very wealthy well-known area famous for cheese and 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 vinegar and um but after during the war of course italy world war ii italy was pretty devastated um the community there wanted a change from the fascist government that was ruling italy and so in the aftermath of the war uh, a number of parents got together and they said they they wanted to go back to work they wanted to rebuild they wanted to bring in more democratic values into their community so they wanted to set up um, a preschool and uh, they came together and the story is brick by brick they built this first center they sold it an abandoned german tank and and uh, they were Connect it. The story goes to uh, with uh, Loris Malaguzzi, who is considered the father of the Reggio Emilia approach. And the story goes that he was clear across the region, and um, he heard what these parents wanted to do. And of course, it was the war, so he couldn't get there easily. There weren't taxis or buses, and you know there wasn't even petrol to fill up the cars. So he rode his bicycle. So that's the legend and the story. And until his death, I think in the mid 90s, he was the the philosopher, the theorist. He's a poet, uh, you know, just a real Renaissance man who was inspired by John Dewey, who um, is an American uh, who is connected to the pre progressive education. Tom movement. talked about John Dewey too. Of course he did because <laughs> he talked. We we've, we've had that conversation. So um, so they started this this. Uh, these centers uh, yeah. with that very first one that was called the uh, um, Villa Sella and they um, they wanted to be in clear contrast to what the children were experiencing in their community so they created this these environments that were really uh, comforting and interactive and where children had a voice and children got to play and they like sanctuaries and and they built this philosophy um, over the years that is inspired so many. In 1993, Newsweek put out uh, a, an edition on education and they were looking at the different, uh, the best education Mo across like the models. world. Yeah. yeah, and so for preschool, it was Reggio. So yeah. that really put Reggio on the map. Um, but it, it, it is an approach, not a model, because they really want you to created in your own context bringing in who you are and who your children are and where your community is they don't want you to just to transplant what they've done but to be inspired by some of the same uh, philosophy so the image of the child is really important the child is capable and competent the child is a builder of theories and so that uh, image if you hold it in your heart and it 
becomes part of your pedagogy. It gives children the right to have a voice and to be able to use materials the way they want it yeah, to. Yeah. And, and so it's really quite inspiring um, and has inspired. So when I met your wife, um, we were bringing these ideas to to the communities in, in Ontario to because people wanted to learn more and they wanted to engage with some of the same materials like light. Light is always a big thing. So playing with light, playing water with, and sand yes, and, yep. and having those experiences. So I'm a big believer in the importance of adults playing. Yeah. So in, if you're going to really understand how light and how you can play with light and how you can interact with light, so that you bring it to children, you've got to do it first. So that was the course um, that uh, I was doing, and I still do it. So this summer from August 18th to August 24th, um, it, we have, it's, it's morphed into being called the Rhythm of Learning in Nature. So it's Regio-inspired, Forest School-inspired, Land-Based Learning-inspired. And it's the idea of coming together uh, with other like-minded educators and learning from each other and learning from the land. Amazing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So tell us, like, uh, what's going on in your life? Like, what are you, what is your future endeavors and what are you working on next? Ooh, um, well, I have a blog. It's called Technology Rich Inquiry Based, and uh, it is just about chronicling the things that I'm thinking about, the things I'm wondering about, about early childhood education practice. And so I'm continuing to write my blog and I'm continuing to, to do workshops. Um, I have a number of textbooks that have been writ written to support uh, early learning students in the college or a university um, streams and uh, play in learning, uh, outdoor and nature-based learning. So I just want to keep myself going um, and be out there. But my area where I'm growing professionally is on is about land-based learning and how to bring indigenous knowledge okay. into the early years and huh. to, to establish and maintain and respect the, the, the knowledge of the knowledge keepers, the elders, and how we can um, learn from them because they, they have such a, an important uh, perspective about learning in nature and with nature. Absolutely. Fascinating. Amazing. That's, that's uh, Diane Cashin, cool. thanks so much for You're joining us. This welcome. has been great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we'd be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or on the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Classcraft, for supporting us. Check out classcraft.com slash on education to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon.